and thank you for coming after a busy day work. Now, can you, yeah, I've got a teacher's voice, and I don't usually need amplifying, but um, they're videoing me, so. And I've got to stand here, because I stood there when we set up the, compu the computer and the, all the gear, and I looked up, and for the next five minutes, my eyes have gone weird. I looked straight. I was reminded of the, what I thought was a Manfred Mann song called Blinded by the Light, but Marek has just told me it was a Bruce Springsteen song, which <laughs> makes it even better. Uh, but I didn't even recognize Anne, and because and it, it was like everybody who came in the room, it looked like an angel with this bright light. So I'm standing over here, if that's OK. You know, see, I, we were saying we think it's four years since I've been to Auckland, and I came in last night to Auckland Airport just before six, and I thought I was in Piccadilly Circus. It was like this hive of activity with people coming from China, from Samoa, from Tonga, from Melbourne, from Sydney. And then we had this absolute downpour, and uh, I, I, it reminded me very much of Brisbane. I think Auckland is very much like Brisbane, where I lived for 18 years. And when I was here last time, I was talking about a, a four-year iPad, iPad project I did with, um, with young children in a mother's group, in kindergarten, in preschool, and in the first couple of years of school. Later on, we actually went up to um, year four, three, I think, and, and year seven and eight with these things called Surface Pros. And I was reflecting that that project came at a time in my career where I'd been doing research for 30 years. <laughs> Makes me feel very old. <laughs> but all my research has been in classrooms with teachers and intact classrooms where I've been encouraging the use of new technologies. And for those of you that do research and, and are academics and write about it, you know, work having a good relationship with teachers and, and wanting to support transformative pedagogies and transformative learning is very important to us. And writing about that is a necessary evil of being, or not a necessary evil, a necessary part of the publish or perish mentality of being in a university. And by nature of those of publications, I've focused on the digital because you only have like three to 5,000 words. And, it, and it, I realized um, in the last three years that focusing on the digital, talking about digital play and digital childhoods and digital this and digital that, was a big mistake. Because it's created this moral panic around screen time and whether or not children should be using the digital at all. And as if you could live in the 21st century without using the digital new technologies. Um, I, came, I had a bit of an epiphany when I realized what's different about learning in the 21st century is not that it's digital, it's that it's multimodal. And that the digital is part of that suite of modalities, whether they be visual, oral, listening, or oral with your mouth, or kinesthetic with your body, or you know all those different modalities. What the kids of today, I refuse to see as a deficit model. I, I see them like Lewis Moll and his colleagues as having these amazing funds of knowledge that they bring to learning contexts, especially they bring to school. And immediately, school has a set of criteria that puts them in a deficit. And I find that you know, something that I not fight against, but something that I rally against, just like I rally against the use of sort of all these guidelines and restrictions on using technologies. People say, oh, technology is just another tool like a pencil. Well, if it was another tool like a pencil, they would have guidelines about how to use pencil and restrictions on using pencils. And if, you know, all these things, if it was, to, if it was like a tool like a hammer, it can't be because using technologies have social, emotional, political, and economic ramifications, and they give you privileges being technology savvy. So I moved to South Australia at the end of last year, and I was very lucky to um, chance upon <laughs> uh, be introduced to the, the Department for Education Learning, uh, Learning Improvement Team. Uh, the labels they give in Departments of Education are so. <laughs> but this, this was an amazing group of people. And I had my first teaching job in, in Adelaide in 1976, so that also dates me. And I just remembered the state as being very innovative, and um, their departments are very supportive. In, in Victoria, I found them a bit more conservative and traditional. Um, but they had done this project um, a 
PIPs, and I can't remember what PIPs stands for now. It was like practices in primary school or something. Anyway, but, but the whole point was it was about STEM. And I was asking Marek before we came in here, is STEM a major imperative in New Zealand education as it is in Australia? Everybody's gone STEM mad in the last three years in Australia. Should have been STEAM. Should, yeah, should have been STEAM, but it's not. Uh, and so I'm going to come to conceptualizations of STEM in a minute, but I just wanted to say I had this wonderful opportunity to work. They had done this, this PIPs, this preschool um, STEM learning with STEM pedagogies, and they wanted to extend it into the first year of school in, in, in South Australia, which is called reception. It's <laughs> like, you know, getting into a lobby of a hotel. But in, in, my, in my home state, Victoria, we call it prep. In New South Wales, I think they call it kindergarten. And in West Australia, they call it pre-primary. But it's that first year of school, which you turn five in Australia. I know you turn six here. So I was, I was really pleased to engage in this relationship with, with the, the department as a collaborative partnership. Um, and meanwhile, I got a thing called an ARC, which took me to Melbourne, Hong Kong, and Singapore to look at the life worlds of 10-year-olds, um, which is a cool, very cool project. But that's a very high-level, uh, prestigious project. This is prestigious, too, but a very different collaborative relationship. I'm going to stand over here and flick the slides. Yay! You know where Australia is. <laughs> but I wanted to, I didn't know whether you knew where South Australia is. So I thought I would show you that. And there we are over in, in New Zealand in the, in the east. But um, hang on, this one, I, I don't know why I did this. Um, so this was called a, the STEM Bridge Project because it was, a, it, it was a, about STEM learning and STEM learning ecologies. And I'll tell you why I call them STEM learning ecologies a bit later. Um, they wanted to, you know, to obviously make the transition smoother from preschool to school. And they wanted to use STEM as the, the means of, of doing that. They used the, some of the teachers from their previous project. Uh, and it was in six sites across the state. Um, and I, no, I, as I said, I, I didn't know where half these places were. And I, I've lived in Australia for 40 years. <laughs> um, so. There, you can see, um, it, uh, it wasn't in Port Augusta, but that was on the map I found. It was in Port Piri, that one there, Port Lincoln, which apparently has got more millionaires, billionaires in Australia than any other city. Um, I don't know, what's that name of the horse that kept winning the Melbourne Cup? Uh, one, of those, one of those horses that has a name like Winx or, or um, you know, Maccabee Diva, that was what it was called. They've even got a statue of this horse in bronze on the waterfront very cool horse that won a lot of people a lot of money and other people, and it's like a fishing port. Kangaroo Island, so cool there. It's like um, the, the tiny school there had 60 people in it. Um, you can see down here Mount Gambia, which is virtually on the border. It's very famous for its blue lake. I mean, and then in the city, we had Allgate in the hills and Parafield Gardens to the north of the city. So we had six sites where the preschool was on the same site as the school. Uh, and that proved to be critical to the success. I'll, I'll talk about uh, how collaborations are successful. This one, one of the critical factors was that the preschool and school were on the same site. They weren't part of the same building. They, they might have had some physical space between them of varying sizes, but they were on the same site. And the principal was responsible for both, but the 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 they also have these clusters of schools whereby the early childhood uh, educators in the preschool are part of a cluster and they have a leader, an early childhood leader to support them for their pedagogies and practices. Now, so this is something that we formulated over the course of the year. So some of the things uh, we, we started off with that we didn't, you know, which I'll come to describe as I go along, but some of the things that we've realized at the end, um, like what we realized that <laughs> see, uh, we were talking, I was talking with the PhD group <laughs> before, and we were talking about finishing your PhD and then going back to the beginning and reformulating. What, <laughs> what we wanted to do was we had this vision that we, we knew where we were going and we, we were all on the same page, but we didn't really articulate it till the end of the students as uh, being articulate. 
to communicate their ideas, feelings, discoveries in different ways, showing how they, how they understand their life worlds and making meaning in their life worlds. Um, and also respectful, uh, working collaborative, collaboratively with others in communities of practice, listening and questioning and striving for common and multiple goals. Um, we thought that was very important. And one of the things we're going to, I'm going to mention a bit later on is about ethical relationships and, and being respectful and knowledgeable, being able to support their plans with accurate and relevant data and facts and it, that illustrate logical and creative thinking in diverse contexts. Just what we want some Trump voters to get like. <laughs> Uh, but of course, you are all already there in, in New Zealand in New Zealand because you got <coughs> Jacinda, and we're all jealous of you. <laughs> um, you know, and this was so important, this aspect of being knowledgeable, because we were very aware that especially school sites with the national curriculum are very content focused. And schools, we felt, were sites of like knowledge regurgitation, knowledge consolidation. We wanted them to be knowledge building communities where children, generated the ideas. So we were very much coming from that perspective of, of the child as confident and capable, just like the Reggio, or aspects of the Reggio approach. So that was a sort of guiding vision. We had some questions. Um, you know what it's like in education departments, or you have an education council. They, they have imperatives on them, put, put on them by various governments and things. You know, the imperative of STEM, of literacy and numeracy, oh, phonics. <laughs> uh, I'm rolling my eyes because the, the year one teachers in Australia are being inundated with phonics and synthetic phonics and jolly phonics. I just call it all phony phonics. But, um, but you know, just the sheer collection of data. Um, so in terms of the imperatives, we were using STEM learning as the context. The focus of the project was on building bridges to support the transition of should be transitions of learners between preschool and school. In what ways can preschool and reception teachers collaborate to facilitate, facilitate transition? Does STEM learning provide a useful context to encourage this collaboration? And what pedagogies enable this collaboration? Um, it was, it's really interesting because, you, as we all know, there's been quite a bit of work done uh, in transition. Uh, and the probably in early childhood, the, the most famous is like Sue Dockett, Bob Perry's stuff about transitions, about sort of the elements. But in reality, it's very much about my granddaughter's going through this now. Yesterday, she had, she's in kindergarten going to school next year in Victoria. She had the second visit. You know, so they, they literally um, tromped over from the pre-kinder to the school, just literally down the road had maybe an hour in the classroom just to get used to the environment and to know the teacher who, I, I don't know, the teacher might be their teacher next year and might not, I'm not sure of that. But it's really sort of a bit tokenistic in many ways. We wanted to uh, um, make that a bit more exciting, I guess, uh, and, and relevant to the children. Um, which brings us to why STEM, apart from the fact that it's this amazing um, at the moment, everybody wants to be doing STEM. The interesting thing here is I had done a project for the Commonwealth Government of Australia in 2016. Um, they wanted, they had done this thing called ELSA, which was like early literacy learning. Oh, not, no, the ELSA was us, I can't remember. They, I, I, I'm amazed at how many acronyms uh, education department so I just can't like, I, I have no idea what PIPS was but I just know the project was preschool STEM I, I was trying to rack my brains thinking what it stands for and they have ELSA and ELLA and LDAR and LDAP I don't know how they <laughs> live in the world <laughs> because it, it's all acronyms but um, I had done some work with the Commonwealth government in 2016 where they wanted me to see um, scope out what apps were available for STEM so I said, OK, I can do that for you. Um, and what's your working definition of STEM? And they said, oh, we haven't got one. Could you come up with one? <laughs> so I actually did some research into what STEM was. Um, and um, it, was, it was really interesting to do this, because if you, like everyone, I went to Google and said, you know, definitions of STEM. <laughs> and uh, we all know it's science, technology, engineering, and maths. 
you'll be interested to know that it started out as MSET, Mass Science, Engineering, and Technology, MSET. <laughs> so obviously, they fiddled around with the words and came up with STEM. But the whole point about STEM is this, that it's, um, hang on, this is our definition. No, no, this is the original definition. I've got my, our definition next, our conceptualization. This is the original one from Pennsylvania, and, and it was misquoted. That The original definition came out of the 80s and into the 90s with, um, with this work found, funded by the Carnegie Foundation in America. And there's two critical aspects about STEM. One, it is a new, inter, well, it's, not, it's an interdisciplinary, which was, is quite new to STEM. Um, it's a, or it's quite new to the, the, the disciplines coming together. It's an, in, an interdisciplinary approach to learning. It's, it's actually a new way of thinking. Secondly, that it's applied to the real world in authentic activity. That's what's important about STEM. It is not science, technology, engineering, and math for the 21st century. Because when I started to research this, I, I found two different types of literature. Literature from um, education departments um, that sort of explained all the, the disciplines um, and you know, what they were separately. They weren't looking at it holistically in a new interdisciplinary way. And research literature that was basically science educators justifying the existence of science in the 21st century and maths doing the same. So it was like they were trying to glitz up maths and science to make it attractive for the 21st century learner because their same old maths and science curriculum that they had had was boring for kids. They, they weren't doing maths and science in secondary school. Hence, when they came to university and wanted to do engineering, the few that wanted to do it, they didn't have the, the foundation skills. So it, it's, it's fascinating to me because I still, I was just talking with someone the other day that people are still seeing STEM as science, technology, engineering, and math separately. That is the total antithesis of what it should be. It's a way of thinking about them being relevant to everyday life. Now, that's what people always, or passionate secondary um, educators usually say about science and math, that you should be interested in it because it's relevant to your, to your real world. But it's not school maths and science is school maths and science. It's really boring for a 15-year-old. They don't see the connections. They don't see the beauty of quadratic equations. And if you've got a, a, a class of 30 year 10 students doing quadratic equations and telling them it's going to be relevant to them when they, be, when they want to be an engineer, you might have three children in that class that are going to do engineering. What are the other 27 supposed to be doing? They're just switched off. So that's the, the point about STEM. And the next thing is, so we wanted then to make that definition or that conceptualization relevant to early childhood. So we came up with this conceptualization. STEM education in the early years provides a context for designing active learning environments that connect with children's natural curiosity about their world. It engages children in authentic investigations using critical and creative thinking in systematic ways to build knowledge, acquire skills, and cultivate confident dispositions for learning. We are seeing STEM, then, as a learning ecology. We are, and I, I don't say a learning environment or a context. If, I, if people talk to me about context or learning environments, I think of space and materials that we can go into and enter and use those as resources for learning. That's very important. But to me, when we're talking about STEM learning ecologies, we're talking about people and place and space and materials interacting in a dynamic way and being interrelated and, and, and in reciprocal relationships so that the materials in, you know, support the learner and the learner extends the material. So it's very interrelated. When we started 
trying to reconceptualize STEM in this way, or reinforce STEM, I guess, we came up with these new words, <laughs> like learning ecology. They were not new words, these combinations of words, these phrases that meant specific things. And some, some of the people in the department said, oh, that's going to be too hard for teachers and, and children. And I said, no, because we, I had done a project in 2005 with Mary Kalantzis and Bill Cope around pedagogy of multiliteracies and learning by design. And what we found was that teachers lacked the professional terminology to describe their work. They actually resonated with these types of words because it, they sort of summed up what they did in their professional activity. And it, it gave them the language to talk about their work. So that was a very deliberate, um, a, a, a deliberate way of conceptualizing, of coming up with this conceptualization with the teachers in the project. I, I told you I was like going forwards and backs over the year. Uh, and so that they could explain it to people. Because they often get asked about STEM. And at the start of the year, they said it was science, technology, engineering, and maths as four discrete things. By September the 7th, they, we had completely changed around to this conceptualization. Um, I'm not sure about the time, so I'm going OK so far, because <laughs> I tend to ramble on. <laughs> um, so some of the things we've explored over the year. I think back to February the 22nd. I can remember the two dates very clearly, February the 22nd to September 7th. On February 22nd, we got them all together in Adelaide. Uh, the, the principals came, the, the uh, early childhood leaders in the cluster, and the, and the educators. Because in Australia, uh, the, teach, the, educate, the people who are with children from birth to five are called, mainly called educators. Some are teachers because they've got a four-year teaching qualification. Um, we tend to call everyone educators now because we don't have that binary of education and care. We have educators. And some happen to be teachers who are registered, and others are not. But they, will, they might have an early childhood qualification. They might have a diploma of children's services. Or they might simply have a certificate three or four, which is a, a, a TAFE qualification. Do you have, you have TAFE here, technical and further education? Like community education, where you have like certificates. Could be a certificate four in, in uh, being an electrician, or oh, this one's children's services, that type of work. Um, so. Um, when, when we met on February the 22nd, and we were talking about STEM, and I was talking about the original definition, and we sort of got the teachers together, the educators together, with you know, on the site. Even though they're on the same site, they didn't, they and they had the transition time. They didn't often have conversations. And so, what was good about this project was that it was sponsored by the Department for Education. They were then the department of education and child development. But then we had a change of government. And usually when governments come in, they change the name. <laughs> and, and South Australia was no exception. They're now the Department for Education. Um, so the, because of the, of the funding involved, the teachers had the time to have conversations. And that turned out to be one of the critical things. So I'm going to give you this overview before I go into some of the Ones, uh, some of the things in detail, because they all interrelate and overlap. They had time to plan together, time to talk to each other. Now, we know how important that is in terms of all the literature that we know about being a reflective practitioner and having that time to reflect on your pedagogies and practices. And they had time to question things. And in this case, they, ha they had time to formulate questions and come to the realization that they had, in fact, focused on specific types of questions. And I'm going to show you some examples of how they changed their view about questioning. But more than that, how important asking diverse types of questions are, and how that can be the catalyst for so many investigations, noticing uh, things about having the time, again, to reflect and actually look at things in your environment and, and look at them in different ways and explore their potential in non-traditional ways of describing, analyzing, and recording. Now, this idea I love, relaunching. Um, relaunching was a, a new term. We didn't make it up. 
But, you know, often when you're a teacher and you're doing a topic, you, you do this, you do that, and it goes really well, or it doesn't, and then you adjust it, and you do some more stuff. And then you think back, and oh, God, I wish I'd done that. Oh, too late, moved on to the next topic. Um, relaunching <laughs> gives you permission, so to speak, to, to revisit, to come back and say, hey, kids, you remember when we were studying those orchids in the Wirra, and, and we wondered about this? And, the, and we, you know, somebody said to me the other day, um, Blah, blah, blah. So we're going to relaunch that idea. I really like that. You relaunch it. And so you, you make a point of connection with the initial activity, and you relaunch it at a later date. Might be three weeks, might be three months. But you help the children to make the connection, or, or the children make the connection. It doesn't have to be teacher-led all the time. Um, that, um, and then you, you, you engage in some new activity around it. While we're on, I didn't realize what loose parts were until this year. There's the whole theory of loose parts. I just thought they were open-ended materials that everybody played. I've never, heard. and it turns out that this, this theory of loose parts was conceptualized by Barbara Hepworth, who's a famous Cornish sculpture, sculptor, and by her son. And I was, and so I've, I've gone mad on loose parts and bought all these books on loose parts since, because that's another lovely thing, you know, having, uh, a range of, of materials, loose parts, with open-ended uh, potential to, so the kids can create anything they want with them. So that was, uh, was something I learned this year. Even when I went to Reggio, they didn't call it loose parts there, so I was there. Um, Inquiry-based learning. Now, this was a very interesting thing for me because I think in early childhood, we, we always we want children to have, you know, sort of ch children-led investigations, explorations, inquiry-based learning. And certainly with the department, as you will see in a diagram I've got a bit later on, there's an imperative around phonics, literacy, numeracy, inquiry-based learning. But what I've come to realize from that iPad project is, and, and sort of the work I've been doing around high-stakes testing as well, um, is that you actually can't do inquiry-based learning in a meaningful way if you don't have some foundational skills. That's where those foundational skills of liter literacy and numeracy have meaning. It's not phonics in a vacuum. There is no doubt that if you want to learn English, you have to have a knowledge of phonics. But you don't have to do hours of mindless activity in synthetic or jolly phonics to do that. In fact, I actually would like to do a study to prove its detriment. I want to call it phony phonics because I think doing phonics out of context, given the nature of phonics and how many sounds like one vowel can make, um, that if you don't learn phonics in context, it's actually really bloody hard. Um, and what I've come to realize from, from the iPad project, and I've just written about um, in the British Journal of Educational Technology, is you have to have these foundational skills of literacy and numeracy learned in situ, in context. Because if you don't have those foundational skills, if you can't recognize letters, sounds, and read, create your own vocabulary orally and in written form, including typing on an iPad, if you don't know number, if you can't describe how you and, and your body move around in space, you can't go off and do inquiries because you just haven't got the resources. So it is, it is essential to inculcate in the early years these, I'm calling them foundational skills, because as soon as you say basic skills, everybody thinks reading, writing, and arithmetic, and immediately wants to give everybody worksheets to do all that stuff, and that's not what I mean at all. But part of the, the early years, from birth to five before children start school, is, is becoming at home with all those foundational skills. You know, I have, I have a three-year-old grandson. Now, every time we go up and down the stairs, he's counting them or looking at signs in the, in the environment and saying, oh, I can see an A, and there's an M for Marlowe, you know, and all those types of things. That's part of everyday activity. So those, those become very important. Now, so that's sort of like the big idea. I'm just going to give you some examples now. So, Allgate prim uh, uh, Kinder and, and um, Primary School are in the Adelaide Hills. Such a beautiful part. Reminds me of here very much. And just outside, 
the kinder, I'm sorry, you, I'm just going to go over here because that light, blinded by the light over there, is um, this space called the Wirra, you know, the Aboriginal name for this sort of natural bit of bushland, but a bit tame because it's, it's adjacent to the kinder. And, and then the primary school is just in front of that. So we, we came to this gobsmackingly obvious thing, <laughs> realization throughout the year. Um, and when we started in, um, in, on February the 22nd, we said to the, the, the preschool teachers and the, and the reception teachers, what could be the focus of this collaboration? And questions came up often. Like, it was like an imperative questions, inquiry learning, um, collaborations, you know, um, the confident child, those types of things. Um, and they, those, those types of topics resonated with both the preschool teacher uh, who had, you know, no national curriculum but has the early years learning framework. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if you, the, if we just, I think they just had their 10th anniversary. I really like the learning, uh, EYLF. Um, and the, the, of course, the, the primary school teachers have this imperative of the national curriculum, the foundation stage, which is like prep one, two, reception one, two. And, and in, for the primary school um, teachers, it's, it's the traditional learning areas of mathematics, English, science, um, creative arts, and those. Um, but this, this knowledge of, of, this understanding, I should say, about questions was important because what we came to realize is we, they wanted to be, I, I guess, more diverse in the types of questions they had because they, they, the teachers said they tended to ask questions orally that required one answer, and they tried, tended to give activities to their children that were sort of too focused, too narrow in their, um, in their structure. And what they wanted to do was have more open-ended um, types of questions so the children could follow their own interests and everything. So this is just, I think, one of the best examples. Um, uh, you know, she said, I was going to ask the children what they know about birds, but I changed the question and asked, what are your ideas about birds? See how those are very different? And how, by just reframing that question as an, an investigative type, both are, um, both could lead to investigations, but the what are your ideas about birds is very different. Um, you still can ask questions like, um, you know, what, what do you know about birds? What do you know about bees or what, what about anything or trees? But, you know, it was the range of questions that was important. And so what the teachers came to realize was that when you say, what are your ideas about birds, children actually come up with very creative hypotheses and, and things they want to test themselves. And, and these are as varied as the numbers of children you have in your group. And that was, was very important. Um, and then, so this comes back to what I was, I was going to say about ethical um, and being respectful and ethical. The children noticed, remember one of the other things they wanted to give the children were for, were for opportunities um, to notice things. And we used noticing rather than observing um, because it came from the children and, and we, we wanted to sort of differentiate that. Um, I should have said before I got into the Allgate example is that in every site, um, the, the conversations that the preschool teacher had with the reception teacher um, led to this planning. They had some shared activities and they had some in the activities that they, you know, they did in their own uh, in their own time. It, you, you know what it's like in, in in everything in life these days. We're all so busy that um, they they made time to come together on purpose because it was about the, the the transition phase, but also that they wanted to have some shared activities and some activities they did together. Um, so this one was a, a preschool activity. So. One of the children in the preschool noticed that, that you know, why aren't there any birds in the Wirra? Uh, and they, they were thinking about, well, how could they attract birds? And somebody came up with the idea of a bird feeder. And then they did this, but then, you know, this was an, classified as an authentic problem coming from the children. Um, but is the solution ethical? Is it, you know, if their birds are wild, is it appropriate to give them manufactured seeds? And, 
And the teacher had these discussions with the, with the children. And, um, you know, and, and they, they had, first of all, they, they left some seeds out, and then they had a proper bird feeder. And then, and then they, they thought about how that would impact on the ecosystem. And I'm going to talk about documentation at the end. But first of all, th these were all documented in term, uh, by in various forms. Because remember, we said that what was different about learning was that it's multimodal. Children talked about it orally. They obviously listened to each other. They drew. They took photographs. And they did voice recordings. Because we felt it was appropriate to introduce sort of the different modalities that how the children could talk about and think about and represent what they knew, but we wanted to give them choice. We didn't say to them, hey, kids, we're going to do this in multimodal forms. We're going to say, you know, these are the opportunities available to you. We, we, had a, we developed this saying, because when we said oh, on February 22nd, the teachers, what do you want to do? And the, like, they, they have that, um, that saying that so many of, of us have, well, we don't know what we don't know. How, we can't really plan ahead like that because we actually don't know much about STEM learning at the moment, and we, you know, we, we, we need your support for that. And that's why doing this with the education department or the department for learning was so good because they provided the people who would go out. I went to each site once, um, and they went oh, to each site about five or six times, and were in constant communication when the teachers had a question. Um, and of course, like every investigation, we were talking about PhDs before, I think it's the, you want to get to the end, but of course, that's the beginning of a new phase. As soon as you um, investigate something, it, le it doesn't come to an end. It's ongoing and continuous and leads to new investigations. So um, that, that ethical dimension became quite significant because it was something the teachers said they, especially the reception teachers with their national curriculum and their reporting, you know, six monthly to the national curriculum, they tend to focus on knowledge outcomes or skills outcomes. They didn't sort of think of all these types of interpersonal communications and understandings that we were just tripping upon. We just found them as, as the project grew. We didn't plan that these would be aspects of the project. They just emerged as the project went on, and we documented them. I'm going to say something about documentation a bit more later on, but because the documentation was huge. If we hadn't documented this, this lovely story would have been gone. You know, um, the, the, the whole notion of um, moving from what do you know about birds to what are your ideas about birds, that's, that was significant. Um, <coughs> so, you know, this was one uh, ex example of the, the documentation, draw what you see. And, and this is where, as pedagogues, as educators, you don't know what you don't know if you're a, a new learner. I certainly am um, always a new learner. You know, you don't know about scientific drawings until you're introduced to one. And so we thought that was another modality of representation of documentation that we could introduce to the children. The ch the, the, this was both the preschool, the four-year-olds, and the school age ones, five, turning six. And, and we, um, you know, again, wanting the ch child to be confident uh, and uh, a confident explorer, we gave them choices. In the beginning, we would probably give them like two choices. But a as we went on, we gave them more choices, and of course, by the end of the year, in fact, less than a year, like nine months later, the children were choosing their own. Again, I think it back to my own skill building in, in various things. Um, you, 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 uh, you get to you find out something, you think, oh, that's really cool, like my eye pen. And then I think, oh, yeah, I could use that you know, more and more and more, because you find more reasons to use it. But um, again, they, we, we introduced scientific Drawings and, and one of the teachers, you know, got the um, somebody came up with the. I always find those a bit macabre, those butterflies that are sort of pinned down. But um, that's just me being a bit squeamish. <laughs> um, but the children found that fascinating because, but who isn't fascinated by butterflies in their symmetry? Um, and you can see they had iPads, and um, so we 
we came in, in the Wirra, and, and like I said, when I went there, um, they were telling me about how they discovered wild orchids. And I, I never even knew that wild orchids existed and that they don't look like the orchids you buy in, in pots. And they were in the Wirra, and somebody noticed it was a particular time of year, obviously, when orchids sprout, and they didn't want to step on them. So they, they built um, with bits of um, bark and, and uh, fallen branches, they actually built a path so that you could you know, see the orchids without stepping on them. And, and then they, had, they made little signs, orchid here, <laughs> don't step on it. Uh, and so things like that. So that documentation was, was very imp an important part of the, of the investigation. Um, and, and as we thought of, of things that might be more relevant, and as the children came up with their own ideas, the, the repertoire of things that we had extended, expanded. In fact, we, then we came to talk about pedagogical repertoire. Um, and we, we talked about opportunities for broadening the teachers when we had our, our reflective sessions. Um, and we sort of spent a day, I spent a day in each school having conversations around what we were doing. And we talked about our pedagogical repertoire being expanded or extended. And, and that was one of, the, one of the things that was most exciting from February the 22nd till I think most of the first visits for me, the, the, the department staff had, were going out regularly, was like, uh, when, when was it? It was like August, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, maybe July. Um, I've never, in 35 years of, of being in education, you know, everybody says change is slow, change is hard, change. I've never seen transformation like it because I can still remember the looks on their faces when we first met them on February 22nd. We said, We want you to do this. They were like thinking, What the hell are we going to do? You know? And by the time they actually thought about it and had these conversations and time to reflect, by July, they were talking about pedagogical repertoires and learning ecologies and STEM as if they'd known it all their teaching life. It was unbelievable. And then when they came, um, then on September the 7th, the idea was for them to do a presentation. And I, and I said, no, we, we need, it's not presentation. It's con we've been talking about conversations. It's just you know, extending on our conversation. You're not doing a presentation. You're having a conversation with your peers about your pedagogical practices, which is part of your professional learning, your professional dialogue. And it seems like a really silly thing to say, like stating the obvious, but I cannot tell you how much difference that made. To actually not say you're going to stand up and present your work, but you're going to have a conversation about your professional practice, about, you know, with, the, with, those, with that nomenclature, it changed the whole dynamic, something as simple as that. It was unbelievable. Um, these were the, the um, uh, younger children again. Um, so again, they were just, like I said, they were embracing change in their pedagogical practice. And, and we all know that, <laughs> that like I said, it's, it's hard because there's so much pressure on educators these days with reporting this and, and in Australia, if you're a year one teacher, you're just drowning in data from the phonics testing. Um, and the, they've been reading articles, and they've been creating this shared vision. Um, I Honestly, if I had done this study as a university academic, um, even with the, the good relationships uh, and the goodwill of teachers, I don't think it would have had the same degree of success and impact. Having that support of the department with the time, the finance for that, having the, the principals and the uh, early childhood leaders at that first session, and having permission to try things out. Another part, uh, important part of our conversations was related to, we didn't, want, we didn't want to call it failure. It actually was seizing on opportunities to take risks. And revising, and <clears throat> when we use the, the t those little B-Bot robots, we talked about debugging. And the permission to learn from those things that didn't quite go as expected, uh, I didn't want, we didn't want to call them failures, because that has such a negative connotation that you know, you, nobody wants to be regarded as a failure. 
learning from your mistakes and having the permission to try things that don't necessarily work. Um, I didn't want to be too um, excited about and have a video in today because um, we got one lovely video of a little boy who's trying to get bugs out of the vegetable garden in the preschool and how he, 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 he's putting all these big sticks and bits of paper on them and then they don't work because there's no wind and then he does this and that. He tries like four different things. It's just a lovely video. And having that shared vision. Um, this, this is a really nice um, story about a learning story about, um, again, about documentation and representation um, in, in terms of uh, thinking about one of the things we, we tried to um, focus on, knowing what was in the national curriculum about technology at the foundational stage, it's really about different ways of thinking, different forms of thinking, systems thinking, looking at the context as a whole, design thinking, thinking about aspects of, of, the, of how things are built and how they're put together and their purpose, and computational thinking, that sort of algorithmic thinking in sequence. And what we were aware of was that it's in the national curriculum, which is for compulsory schooling, but in fact, young children in, in kindergartens, three and four, we were focusing on the four-year-olds, were doing this as part of their everyday life. We, the, the, the educators just weren't calling it systems computational and design thinking. And um, some children were, were playing, uh, and they were you know, playing with various types of, of learning materials, whether, uh, I can't remember the names of them, there's like all these construction things, you know, from Lego and Duplo up to these ones. There's, some are called magic blocks, and some are, in the old days, we used to call them Meccano. <laughs> Um, but uh, whether they be constructions like that particular one or whether they be with wooden blocks, they were being engineers. That's what they were doing. They were using scientific skills, and I, and I say scientific in a broad way, scientific being mathematical and science, um, and, and these are forms of technology to create something. But because of the work we've been doing with the, with the children, they then, and we were talking about um, documentation and recording and various sort of, this um, little boy, I think it was a boy, um, then went to, on to draw a different representation of his three-dimensional construction. So, and then we have conversations around the different modalities. So it becomes like an integral part of the conversation and the language and, you know, it's sort of really internalized, I guess, if you want to use a psychological term, and it becomes part of the discourse. And so that one, um, that was interesting. It was, it, the other th the thing was interesting with, about this story was that he, he started off with small sheets of paper and he couldn't fit it on and kept get, getting bigger pieces of paper. And in the end, he ended up with, I think, some um, brown paper you know, off a roll so he could fit it all on, <laughs> which, which in itself was an interesting mathematical engineering problem. And then he was explaining to everybody there was these opportunities to have the bigger conversations with the groups to explain the strategies. Um, so all this work we were doing in, in schools with the department, you know, there, there was like on, on February 22nd, I can, like I said, I can remember as if it was yesterday, um, the teachers were selected, I guess, by their, their principals because it, the schools were, there wasn't just one reception teacher, there was a, a few. Um, to join in, and you know, they've got so many things on them, put on them. They've got to, like I said, do phonics, they've got to do literacy, they've got to do numeracy, they've got to do inquiry-based learning, they've got to do STEM learning. And um, one of the things that the teachers got very savvy about was the interconnections between all these, because these are all imperatives put out by education departments, usually in response to a sort of a political context, because the the Minister of Education, um, quite um, genuinely, needs to sort of make a mark and, and have a, like a hallmark or, or say that literacy scores have improved or writing has got better. And so the teachers get very good at thinking about the connections between all these things that are put upon them, literally. And you know, the inquiry-based learning process was, was a, 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 just one example of something that really connected with them to, to link to this STEM work. Um, and, you know, 
they, they have to report to it, they have to justify it to their principals who then report to the higher echelon. So this is just an example of how we incorporated other initiatives because, I, you know, we, I, I, education departments are big places and I, we were working with the learning improvement section within there, there's early childhood, there's primary, there's others, then there's the literacy and numeracy section, then there's the, you know, the uh, other blah blah section, they all come up with their own policies and put them on teachers. So making all those connections um, is difficult for us because we don't know all the things. And the other one was LDAR, learning, design, and reflection. And you know they, they've got some other section had um, come up with these principles, and they were quite good. And so we brought them in here, and so the teachers could you know could uh, make the connections and the relaunching. Um, this to me is the best example of transitions. These are the, the kindergarten preschoolers and those are the schools. And they, they found the, they had loose parts and they, had, they found this plastic one. It was, it was weird stuff. I don't know what it was. It was very shiny and silver. And they built a bridge from the preschool to the school. And, uh, and, and uh, they, they were worried that somebody might fall over and crack their head on the brick so they got out the equipment. Um, and to me, that is a metaphor of the STEM bridge project, the bridge between the most successful transition from preschool to school. Um, because, you know, there's fences between these places, so it immediately inhibits collaborations. Uh, but the, the children overcome it. One of the, the fascinating things for, for me um, was the... The, the different pedagogical approaches, of course, from preschool to school, you know, the play-based curriculum to the chasm then of going to school. I'm not saying all teachers have activity sheets and what have you, but it's very much set activities in school with a beginning and an end and a time and a bell and a regulation. What I was really surprised was by how willing the reception teachers were to engage in play-based learning because they literally thought it was play and it didn't have any structure and that it was, it was totally open-ended where it could have aspects that were obviously child-initiated but that, that you could support and scaffold the children in their learning. And um, there was one lovely story from a, a school where um, the, the reception were doing an activity with, um, with the preschool uh, and the, the, um, the year one teacher happened to be taught, passing or, and talked to the, uh, the, the reception teacher and said, yeah, but it's just playing. And she said, no, it's the science foundation level 2.1, blah, blah, blah. It's the, it's the maths three point, you know. And she, she literally reeled off everything that was in this national curriculum because she was such an experienced teacher. And she can report to those outcomes but not in, a, not in a synthetic way, in an actual realistic way. And, and she said it was so pleasing to see the look on this year one teacher's face. I've got five minutes. I'm nearly there. <laughs> I can't remember how many I've got now. But the, 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 I just want to show you the, the sort of the environment. This is a one school where they actually realized that they didn't maximize the flow from inside to outside. So that's just a, you know, something that they, they focused on as something they wanted to change in their practice over the year. And using that outside space and actually constructing things out there. Um, we don't have bad weather in South Australia, so there is that opportunity to go from inside outside. But realizing, the, for the reception teachers, realizing they could get out of the classroom. That was, sounds simple, but it was quite a big realization. Um, look, I'm on the findings in the last five minutes. I mean, we, we haven't really got traditional research findings, but you know, these are the things we've come to realize over the year. At, well, as I said, it's not quite even the year, and I'm going to come to the, the, the sort of um, what we're doing in terms of pedagogical uh, doc documentation. We've got these, I, I highlighted the elements like the questioning, the curiosity, the child is confident, the relaunching, the conversations, those types of things. But there was that opportunity to really collaborate, to, to make the transition. Well, to, the collaboration sort of almost uh, made the transition, well, we'll, we'll see, I guess, uh, at the end of the year, uh, when, or the beginning of next year, that the, 
that the transition will be much more, you know, fluid. It will be seamless to the to the um, uh, to, from the preschool to the reception, um, and the extension of the pedagogical repertoire and the the, the professional language, uh, having the language to communicate what your practices are is critical because you you know for shared understandings um, and the pedagogical conversations. Um, and that's about the flexible approaches to the space and the, the idea about the learning ecologies rather than the learning environments. Um, and they, you know, they had had a traditional view of transition with these visits or visit at the, at the end of the year that they're doing, they would traditionally do now. But this has been a whole year thing. Um, and I wanted to, so what, we, what we're doing now is we're trying to, like trying to herd cats, <laughs> we're trying to get together with our, um, with the department. What we've got is the, the PIPS project where they did like documentation panels. Uh, and they had this lovely um, thing where they, it's called STEM Botanical where some, um, some preschools in Adelaide had a, a, a sort of a, a, a gardening type focus and plant type focus and they did a, an exhibition of documentation panels in the botanical gardens in Adelaide. And we're building on that and, and, some, and, and the idea of Reggio um, documentations that are pedagogical documentations because for the teacher, they, they are, I guess, a synthesis of what they've been doing, but also for display so that the children can say, oh, I remember when we did shadow dancing, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I wish we had done this and that's when you relaunch it. So these pedagogical documentation panels serve different purposes. Um, they serve the purpose for the teacher to be a reflective practitioner. They, they, they act for the children as a, as a, a re record of their, of their investigation and relaunching ideas. But more than that, they actually give other teachers the opportunity to say, oh, I never thought of doing like light and color like that. So they become a resource for another teacher who doesn't want to have to go to a professional learning activity all day, who hasn't got the book, hasn't got the resources. And these are all going to be online. So what we'll have is a report to the, um, to the department that will also be accessible to teachers. We've got a position statement with that conceptualization and, and uh, the why, what, and how of STEM, that it isn't science, technology, engineering, and maths. It's a new interdisciplinary way of thinking. Um, we've got these, uh, we've got the STEM Botanic and the PIPS uh, panels, and we've got these panels. And, and we've got video of little learning stories, that, and all of these are going to be online. So I'll have to, if you're interested, Marek and Maria, I'll get, give you the examples. See, that one was about, um, and with, these are going to all be done by designers, not by me, who just thrown them together now with the, with the teachers. So they'll have different components. They'll have photographs. They'll have examples from the children, and they'll have um, reflections from the teacher and reflections from the children. And then they will act as um, investigation, uh, sort of inquiry investigations catalysts for others, for other teachers to say, I can do that. Because that was another thing that was really critical, that the reception teachers saying, I didn't know I could do this. I didn't have this. I didn't know that this was you know, an idea. And now I can see that it's so valuable to my work and the work of the children. This is an example of relaunching. Um, and I, I just love that concept. I don't, I don't think we coined it. I don't, obviously, I think one of the teachers said it. The other one was one of the schools came up with that how, how her pedagogy had shifted to a pedagogy of responsiveness. You know, I've heard about a pedagogy of love, a pedagogy of care, but not a pedagogy of responsiveness. And you know, this idea, we were very much into children generating their own theories and articulating those theories, just like scientists do. Um, and, you know, like this is what they, we, they had theories about um, shadows, about the sun and about the planets. Why, why does each day the sun move? How does the sun follow you? And that led to an investigation of, of shadows. See how those questions are from the children. And sometimes, we will we'll, we'll reframe the questions, and other times we won't. That, you know, that's what being a professional uh, and acting as a, you know, being a teacher is all about. Um, and, oh, that was lovely. That was Kangaroo Island. 
they had this, they were finding it difficult to take turns having conversations. So they come up with, I love this talking stick. This is a talking stick. And then it, when it was your turn, you had to listen. It was all about questioning, listening, talking. And when you had the stick, that was your, your time to talk. Everybody in the group gave you permission to talk. And they vowed to listen to you. And then when they had a response, they had the talking stick. So I think, oh, oh that was just summing up. Um, you know, we had so many. We, uh, like most projects, you have tons of data. Um, but th to me, that was a, a, a quote from um, one of the reception teachers who um, sort of summed up this whole amazing year. Like, this project has been one of the most amazing that I've done because I don't usually see this much change so fast. Mm -hmm. I think change is invigorating and good. Uh, and I think back to the looks on their faces when we told them to, like, think about what they could do on February 22nd. And they're like, oh, my God, another thing to do to you know, the first visit and the tent, they were, we had a whole day just to have conversations. And then we were saying, meeting as a group again on September the 7th, when we first of all said, you know, we want you to present your work. And I said to Joe, no, we, we need to phrase it differently. They don't want to do a presentation. So we changed it to, what, what can you share in, in the conversation with the, with the other teachers and uh, educators? And that was, that summed it up. <sighs> Sorry, I tend to ramble on. <laughs> Um, just before we say thank you to Nicola, we've got a few minutes for questions. Are there things that are on top for you that this presentation triggers? Mm. Nobody ever wants to ask the first question. No. <laughs> it's got to be you, Murray. <laughs> Timetable, the timetable still, yeah. That you know, the biggest change was with the reception teachers because their their lives and the requirements on them, because it was compulsory schooling, national curriculum, yeah. all that, um, and you know, just the sheer bell. Well, they don't have bells now anymore. They have like these beeper things. Um, they actually realised that this project gave them permission to vary that. I mean, they. You know, officially, lit officially and literally, you have to spend, you know, what is it, 180 minutes on this, to, you know, and on that. Um, but because of the way we were conceptualizing our thinking around STEM, and especially that when that teacher was saying how the year one teacher said, oh, you're just playing. Mm. And she said, this project really made her think about using her time more efficiently and saying, yeah, I'm doing this activity now with my children or with the preschool children. I'm doing science, I'm doing maths, I'm doing social studies, I'm doing physical education. So that was the, one of the biggest changes. It, they realized that they didn't have to compartmentalize their timetable. They could actually be much more creative in their justification of that time. But better than that, their children's learning was integrated and authentic and more meaningful. And literally, she could, she was at the, the particular teacher I'm talking, there were two of them. And they, they had been, uh, one was in prep uh, reception, what should they, I mean, uh, for six years and one for eight. They really knew that curriculum because like, I teach a subject at university around the technology curriculum. Oh my God, I just want to shoot my foot off with boredom when I look at that curriculum. It's awful. I mean, it's got those, the, the, the thinking, but it's got 20 pages of glossary. I don't know how any teacher can get their head around it. But yeah, so that efficient use of the reception time, plus um, the, it actually saved them time. 
in the long run, and, and it made the learning more meaningful, which was a significant finding. Yeah, lovely. Catch up with Nicola then. We're just going back to the courtyard into the next building and up one floor. So you can yeah. follow one of us. So I would like to say thank you so much. Oh, thank Nicola. you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> there was much richness in this hall that I'm sure everyone can relaunch some memories yeah. into their own conversation. But for me, it was very much about bringing and back to the hall. Yeah. The conversations, not taking them for granted, and making Thank you, Maria. Um, and, to, and to learn from children. Yeah. Uh, at any age. So thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. See ya. Thank, thank you. you.